Let us now welcome our next speaker. He turned a once-failing government-linked commercial airline into Asia's biggest player in the budget airline industry. Tony Fernandez, the Malaysian-born CEO of AirAsia, studied accounting at the London School of Economics and, for a while, worked in the music industry in the UK. He served as regional vice president for Warner Music Southeast Asia from 1999 to 2001. When its parent company announced its merger with another company, he felt it was time to pursue a long-held dream of having his own business. With no prior airline experience, he and his partner transformed Air Asia into one of the fastest growing and most successful low-fare airlines in the world. In 2007, he started a no-frills hotel chain, Toon Hotels, with properties in Britain, Australia, and the Far East. Tony Fernandez is an inspiring leader who turned his big dreams into an even bigger reality. Please welcome the CEO of Air Asia, Mr. Tony Fernandez. Hi everyone, morning, uh, hey morning, oh wow, powerful Malaysian here, <laughs> anyway, um, I've got a presentation somewhere, do I just click this, All right, this is a very impressive uh, video presentation, I'm not used to it because I'm very low cost, so, <laughs> Well done to Doris for uh, spending so much money. <laughs> Fly in Air Asia, you'll get it back. Because we're much cheaper than Cebu and Pal. <laughs> and better. Uh -huh. All right, I'll run this through. So, um, as the video said, I came from the music business. I had no experience in uh, airlines. I took over Air Asia um, 14 years ago. Uh, for 25 cents, we had two planes and 200 staff, and I didn't have a single bit of uh, airline experience. So to all your SMEs, don't let anyone tell you that you can't do anything, because business is business. It's about a top line, uh, maximizing your top line, minimizing your cost, and um, having a strong balance sheet. It's all about cash, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. By the way, this is a great audience. I didn't know there were so many people here. I just did APEC, and uh, they made me wear a jacket. Uh, they were very worried about my appearance because I'm low cost. <laughs> the, the Jollibee guy kept sending me notes about this business attire, etc. I was the low cost part of the segment, so I get a free Jollibee burger after I did a speech. <laughs> anyway, going back to uh, uh, what I did, so we started with two planes 14 years ago. You know, we started this airline, we signed for this airline three days after 9-11. And uh, we delayed it till December because we didn't have enough money uh, to actually pay for the bonus. So me and my partner were remortgaging our house and uh, the owner of the airline was really good to give us that time. So really, we really, really came from humble beginnings. So don't let anyone tell you you can't do anything because if you put your mind to it, you really can. And over the, that was the original Air Asia. It had a bird. I don't know why airlines are preoccupied with animals. Uh, you know, we, we have tigers, we have lions. In Malaysia, we actually have an airline named after an insect, Firefly. Uh, really dumb name because Firefly doesn't, is the shortest living insect. And so we 
so I want to focus a little bit on branding because SMEs, you know, you have great ideas and the ideas are lost because you don't put enough money into marketing. So we dropped the bird. I tried really hard not to be red because, you know, everyone thinks I want to be Richard Branson. But can I just assure everyone that I have no intention to go in a balloon at 36,000 feet and I have no intention to go to the moon. There's too many good things to do in Manila than go to the moon. And so I dropped the bird. And if you look at the biggest logos in the world, there's only one image, right? If I say Shell, you're thinking of Shell. If I say Nike, you're thinking of the Nike shoes. If I say Coca-Cola, you're thinking of Coca-Cola. So I dropped the bird and I used AirAsia as our logo and I changed it to red. Well, it looks a lot better, doesn't it? And that's just not the women as well. But the, the whole appearance of the airline looked much better. And over the last 14 years, we've grown from two planes to 200 planes. We, have, uh, we went from 200 staff to now we have 17,000 staff. And in our first year, we carried 200,000 passengers. And now, uh, this year, we'll carry 55 million passengers. And uh, we've won the world's best low-cost carrier uh, seven years in a row. And last week was really a cool week for me. Uh, Air Asia won the Asia's best cabin crew. Uh, we're the first LCC to beat all the full service carriers. It's a fantasy of mine. We beat Singapore Airlines. Uh, so, we, um, so I keep telling the Singaporeans there's a new girl in town. Twice the fun and half the price. Uh, no more Singapore girl. The Air Asia girl is here. So, so what's our secret? How do we do it? I'm gonna, I don't have long because Mr. Uber took all my time. Uh, and on AirAsia, we're on time, generally. Uh, <laughs> provided Manila Airport traffic control allows you to land. Okay. I talked to the president about that about 1,001 times. Um, so what's our secret, really quickly? by 14 minutes and 41 seconds. Uh, three things I want to focus on. One is branding. The other is people. Your biggest asset are the people in your company. And I'll spend a little bit of time on that uh, when we go through. Ah, it's the people slide. So, you know, uh, when, I was, um, when I first started in AirAsia, it's another point for all you SMEs. I don't think you'd be an effective leader unless you go down to the ground and know exactly what's happening. Too many Asian CEOs lock themselves in the office and uh, just command. So I used to carry bags uh, once a month. I used to uh, be a steward once every two months. And then the job I hated most, you know, checking in people, I used to do every three months. But I wouldn't have made effective decisions unless I did that. And I'll give you two stories on that. Uh, when I was carrying bags, when we were on the 737, you know, we used to just throw the bags in to the cargo hold. I mean, not throw the bags in, lovingly put the bags in, you know. <laughs> Nice bag, put it in. Uh, when we, when we um, went to the Airbus, it was a few inches taller, and uh, we couldn't throw the bags in. So my boys asked me for belt loaders, and I said, no, no, we can't afford that, no belt loaders. So when they, the next time I carried bags, they put me on the Indonesian flights. Now, people who fly on AirAsia generally bring their house with them. Uh, <laughs> people who fly to Indonesia bring their neighbor's house as well. <laughs> So there were a lot of bags, <laughs> okay? And I almost destroyed my back in the process, and I went, okay, guys, I'm wrong. You're right. We go buy belt loaders tomorrow. Now, if I didn't do that, I probably would have destroyed many people's backs and probably started a union. In 14 years, we don't have a single union. Malaysian Airlines has 41 unions. And so I think corporate culture is so critical and accessibility to your staff. You know, I dressed up today for, you know, I bought these trousers in M&S because I didn't have any uh, in Glorietta because Tony was driving me nuts about his business attire, business attire, business attire. <laughs> but generally, I, I just wear a t-shirt and jeans. And I deliberately look worse than my staff because then there's no distance between you and your staff. If you look worse than them, they have every confidence in talking to you. And I'd rather have 17,000 brains working for me than just you know, 10 guys uh, telling me everything. Gives me problems in Malaysian airports because they generally think I'm an illegal immigrant uh, that just jumped off the latest plane, but I'll deal with that. So, 
I think being a good leader is accessibility to your staff, ability for them to communicate with you, and being very transparent. The second part of why I went to the ground is we couldn't have gone from two planes to 200 planes without people. And you, know, you weren't going to manufacture pilots uh, or just pick them up from the, you know, the, the Rustan store or whatever. You had to go out and build it. So I decided to look for people within my organization. And this is, if there's one lesson you take away from it today is be unconventional in how you look for your people. Uh, there was, when I was carrying bags, I saw so many bright kids who just left school when they were 13 or 14 due to financial reasons who were much, much smarter than me. So when we had our first cadet pilot program, we opened it up to everyone. I said, I don't care whether you have A-levels, O-levels, whatever. If you want to be a pilot, we'll support you. And our first 18 cadets, 11 came from within the company. We had left school, you know, 14, 15. They were store boys, um, accounts, clerks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, we had one boy who uh, left school when he was 13. I carried bags with him, and I thought he was so smart. And I said, "I'll pay for you to go do this." He had the highest marks ever in the Malaysian Flying Academy. He, was, he carried bags for us, and he took the exams, and he had the highest marks ever. And today, he's a captain. So you imagine, you join the airline to carry bags. Eight years on, you're a captain in a brand new A320. And that's the energy, and that's the power in AirAsia, that people believe they can do anything. You know, females, there were no female pilots in Malaysia. And I said to my captain, I said, you know, why are there no female pilots? And he came up with the most ridiculous answer that can be never repeated again. And I said, if a woman can run a country, she can certainly fly a plane. And now we have 45 female pilots. And the other day was history. Uh, <laughs> captain was female, co-pilot was female, all the cabin crew were female, and all the passengers were male. Uh, <laughs> that bit's not true. Um, and the girl on the, on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, when I was in a bar one day having an orange juice, uh, she came up to me and said, look, my dream is to be a pilot. I said, go for it. She's a very smart Thai girl, and she went for it. She calls me up a year later and says, everyone says I'm really beautiful. Can I take part in Miss Thailand? Very interesting concept. Um, but OK, if you win, I get to use your photograph for the rest of your life for free. And she said, OK. And she won Miss Thailand, she took part in Miss Universe, and uh, came fifth in Miss Universe, and now she's back in AirAsia as a captain. So she's the only, we're the only airline in the world with a Miss Thailand flying for them, okay? <laughs> but, but the moral of the story is not that. The moral of the story is because we're such a flat structure, she had the courage to ask her, to live her dreams, to ask whatever she wants. She, had, she was one phone call away from me. And I think effective decision making is about removing bureaucracy, is about allowing people not to be afraid and telling you. We have grown so quickly because everyone's got the same mission, everyone's got the same vision. Branding is not about external branding. Branding, most importantly, is about internal branding. Because if you, if you want to sell your product outside, if the people inside your company don't understand it, then you're 50% loss, right? So we spend a lot of time on that. So the biggest asset you have in your company is your people. My biggest job is to turn raw diamonds into diamonds. And to all of you guys, as you're competing against the bigger boys, your advantage is your flexibility and your ability to get more out of people than big corporate stuffy organizations that don't allow growth. And branding. You know, we've we spent a lot of money on branding. Um, initially, I used to wear my cap everywhere because we had no money and make controversial statements so that people would take photographs of me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I do that less now. And you know, we, 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 didn't, we were a small airline with seven planes, but we sponsored Manchester United. Very, very difficult for me because I hate that football club. <laughs> but you have to be a prostitute once in a while, you know? Uh, and so we were a little airline, but yet we were in Old Trafford. And people before used to think, oh no, you know, you have to stand on the plane, you'll be sitting next to a chicken, etc. But when you sponsored Manchester United, suddenly it's like, wow, that's a serious airline. And we were cheeky with advertising. I always had this running battle with Singapore. You know, when they, they blocked me for seven years between KL and Singapore, and I, 
probably because of my mouth. And, uh, but we did this great ad. So everything in Singapore, Singapore girl, Singapore girl, Singapore girl. So we, we put up, and they have a Singapore Airlines stewardess looking up in the sky at a mega top. So we put our little plane there, put our four girls, and said there's a new girl in town, she's twice the fun and half the price. And instantaneously everyone knew us, not because of that ad, but if you look at two skyscrapers, I erased Singapore Airlines Tower from the Singapore skyline. And instantaneously everyone knew us. So make sure you always put branding into you and be a little bit on the right side because you never know. Technology has been a great leveler for us and we, we really, the ability for us in the early days, no one used the internet before we came along. And now 85% of our business is on the internet. We're a big, big believer in uh, mobile technology. And I think it's really important for SMEs to really involve themselves in technology. I won't go through this because I think David covered it very well, but data is king. Please make sure you have a little bit of a budget to know your customers because that's, uh, that's crucial uh, going forward. So that covers what I want to say. I just want to tell everyone out there that you, know, you can live your dreams because I, as a five-year-old, I always felt I wanted to own an airline. As a 13-year-old, my parents sent me to boarding school. They didn't like me very much. And they packed me off to England. I remember getting on this Qantas plane and wearing a unaccompanied minor and arriving in London. And the first thing I thought was, God, everyone's white here. You know, I told my daughter, you have no such problem as when you're in Heathrow now, everyone's Indian. Uh, <laughs> so you feel quite at home. <laughs> and I remember going back to school and I arrived at Epsom College and I went to boarding school and think, Jesus Christ, what have I done wrong in my life? And I was calling my mother with, you know, 10 pence coins because we didn't have mobile phone then. And I said, can I come home for, for Christmas? And she said, no, it's too expensive. And it was in my brain always that I wanted to start a low-cost airline. So live your dreams because from some dreams come some reality. Don't worry what, whether people laugh at you or whatever. Because if you don't dream, you won't have that, that wonderful opportunity to change your life or change a business opportunity. Never take no for an answer because thousands of people will say, no, you can't do it, it can't be done, etc., etc. You know, there's a very fine line between brilliance and stupidity, but no is a key word. And always be positive because you only have one life and don't be afraid of failure. Because if you fail, you can try again. You don't want to sit there at 55 and say, I wish I did it, because you can't press a rewind button. So thank you very much for listening to me.